Welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke, and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. So today we're joined by Lewis Bedford, co-founder of the Sockstar Project and Born Free Youth Ambassador. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. How's things? Good. Yeah, very well. Um, I'm back down from uni at the moment. Yeah, and you're actually from this neck of the woods originally. Yeah, is that that's right. right yeah. yeah, I grew up in Cranley. Um, yeah, not far from here. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And you went to the same school as Will Travis, is that's that right? That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Will and I met um, at a charity fundraising do when I was yeah, 15 and yeah, a long time ago. Amazing. And you've been um, an ambassador for us for quite a few years now. Yeah. Do you want to tell us how did that come about? Yeah. So I used to play a lot of cricket when I was younger, um, representative cricket. And I felt that um, I'd love to you know, share a message of conservation through playing. So, yeah, very small um, token of, of affection to Born Free. I had a little sticker on the bat. Um, which was yeah only a couple of inches long, but it was it was really good. Um, I got to know more about Born Free and, and share my story um, with them, and they the story that I shared with Born Free to my friends was you know at 15 years old was great, and people were kind of confused but also interested in in what they were up to. At yeah. 15, that's really nice. Yeah, yeah. So has wildlife always been sort of part of your agenda? Um, it's been it's been there somewhere. Yeah, I think it's always been there somewhere, and that and that love's definitely grown re- in recent years. Uh, to begin with, uh, Mum's from Zimbabwe. Um, and she's been involved in wildlife when she was younger, um, immersed in it, you could say. Uh, but recently, um, she's been working conservation. And I think as that's happened, I've been, you know, opened my eyes to a lot more of conservation's um, issues, but also triumphs. Uh, and yeah, fallen in love with it, I think, a little bit. Nice. Uh, but it really enjoying it, yeah. And you ran the um, London Marathon for Born Free, didn't you? Yeah. Previously. Yeah, How yeah, old were you then? Was that? That was 18. I, I turned 18 in, in March and then ran in April. Um, so I was young and pretty foolish. Um, it was a long way. And speaking of foolish, uh, you've been clearly been bitten by the bug. Yeah. Um, and you're running it again. I am. And yeah. I have to say, actually, um, I don't know if the camera can see it, but I've never actually had anyone yeah. turn up to a podcast with walking boots on. Wave for the camera. Yeah. yeah. So tell me, so this is, part of your marathon effort right yeah yeah sadly it is I'm going to be running all of the way in these boots so tell me what's the story behind so wildlife ranges are a big focus for Sockstar project um, and obviously I want to really put myself in their shoes uh, avoiding that cliche I think it's really important that we find out what does it actually feel like to be a ranger running and what does it feel like for them to travel long distances like they do so yeah 26 miles in these boots I think it's going to be a pretty painful ride but really rewarding. I think it's really captured a lot of people's imaginations to think, okay, like what are the limits that rangers can go and how far can they go? And I think I'm going to try my best to, to match that. Yes. And how is training going? It's been going okay. I think it's a bit up and down. Um, I've been training a bit up at university, mm-hmm. but Durham is very hilly. So I've been kind of losing the, the will to live up the hill. Um, but yeah, it's been okay. I think I've only got my boots very recently and I've been quite careful not to run too far uh, in trainers and just really build my body up and get ready. So are they the same kind of boots that rangers would wear? Yeah, they're a very similar weight and, and slightly similar design, um, depending on which terrain they're in, different colours, but yeah, very similar shape and, and size, yeah. And how have you found fundraising for that? Because obviously, and we'll go on to Sockstar in a minute, but obviously sure. you're kind of like, you've got quite a few fundraising yeah. slash initiatives yeah. that you're pushing. I think how it's, have you found the two? I think it's difficult to fundraise from, from your friends because you never want to feel like you're always asking. But often, um, yeah, you've had to sort of nudge people and say, do you mind donating a tenner or whatever that is to, to my marathon, but also to Sockstar and also to Born Free or any other charity that I think is doing something brilliant. So, yeah, I think they might get sick of me at some point, but for now they're doing just fine. But you're right. I think they're kind of like t- taking people's inspiration, like doing something different. You know, you're not just running the marathon. Um, you're doing it with boots on. I think that's quite yeah, important. I mean, yeah, I mean, the first time I ran, you know, donations came flooding in because, you know, it was something new and I was very young. This time it's the same challenge, but slightly different style, I think. And that's important to to make sure that I'm not just doing the same event and, and that I keep trying to level up on the challenges that I'm doing in terms of difficulty, I think. Yeah. Um, so tell us about Sockstar Project then. Yeah. So I founded Sockstar in uh, September uh, in 2018 that was just before freshers week at uni um, and Ambitious. decided yeah it was yeah <laughs> foolish um, and decided that I was going to start a mini pilot project that officially wasn't called the Sockstar project um, and I just wanted to send a uh, hundred pairs of socks to a group of rangers in Zambia at Game Rangers International um, and I thought it's a really great way to kind of uh, 
get a message between us in the UK and, and the Western culture to, to ranges in Africa and different cultures as well um, by the sharing of a sock. You know, everybody wears socks pretty much. And I think we raised 100 pairs of socks. Half was just from cash, but also people sent socks to me and we sent them out in a suitcase a couple of weeks later. And the response that I got from from doing that was brilliant. Um, people were very interested in what I was doing. And I left it for a, about a term and a half at university. I, you know, first term was, was very busy at uni and just finding my feet there. And then realized that I'd still love to do something in that. And so very quickly, I kind of started strategizing how we could build Sockstar into a bit more of a scalable entity. And yeah, very quickly, um, it kind of skyrocketed. I had a great launch in, I think, May of this of last year. And then, yeah, very quickly it became bigger and we started fundraising bigger numbers, um, sending more boots and socks and gloves and basic needs to, to rangers in Zimbabwe with Dr. Nama Khan in National Park Rescue, which is our second project. So we've got two at the moment. Yeah, which okay. is great. So let's just go back to that very beginning. So why did you pick rangers? Like, where did that kind of I that think, idea from I think come from? Bizarrely, the first time I ever wanted to get involved in conservation, I wanted to volunteer at a charity. But I realized that it's probably the only way it was going to happen would be to sort of sign letters to donors saying, thank you very much for your donation, which is still very important. But I really wanted to do something that made an impact. And then being a bit of a dreamer, I wanted to raise money for a drone because I thought mm -hmm. that'd be a great way to you know, contribute into conservation and something that would capture people's imaginations again. Um, but very quickly, I realized it was, it was pretty difficult to do to raise that sort of funding. Um, so I scaled it the total reverse and went to really simple bits and bobs that rangers need. And they're socks, boots, underwear, feminine hygiene products and similar things like that. And very quickly realized that that's the most simple way to raise uh, and to create an impact um, to rangers. And I feel rangers in their own way have a totally different message but in the same web of conservation that's so and i feel like it's so niche as well like those i guess the the obviously you fundraise as well but those are the kind of things that you wouldn't think about it's those like the soaps then things like socks that you just wouldn't think about that come so easily to us yeah um you've got quite a niche um quite a niche market there yeah um so tell us a little bit about game rangers international and then we'll get on to national parks sure, in so a minute game so. rangers international specifically a brilliant project and um, they have three key areas and the most important ones to us are resource protection and community outreach so making sure that the people in the areas and the national parks do get support in which country is this in zambia yeah um so kafui national park is really important that the communities are engaging with with the elephants and also with um, the rangers uh, and the resource protection in, in zambia is really important as well so the rangers there we've managed to send hundreds of pairs of boots to which is great and we've kind of tried to really focus on the most important things to the rangers mm -hmm. so we consult them first uh, you know we try not to um expect and say oh, and we're sure you need boots or we're sure we ask them first which is important so yeah game rangers international have um, also another arm of their work which is um, rehabilitation of, of wild animals which is really important and their projects there are very heavily science-based um, and they're very well run and it's important that we keep supporting them in that way um, and they were our first ever project and we're proud to have them on board um, and whilst we don't contribute a massive amount to them we, we're doing a little bit um, to support them and yeah the relationship between us and them has been great so where did you get those boots from then initially so we buy the boots in country we mm -hmm. try and support local ecosystem and economy at the same time so we feel that by purchasing them from local stores we can generate a micro um, investment as well as also yeah, absolutely. You know, buying boots for rangers so it's a uh, it's important that we don't rack up costs in the uk uh, I'm sending you know, parcels and big suitcases out to these countries because it comes with a variety of costs, flying costs and also logistic costs. So, yeah, we try and stay in country if we can. And your second main project um, is, as you mentioned, with Dr. Nama Khan, um, <clears throat> and that's um, National Parks Rescue. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because that's uh, still quite heavily elephant conservation focus as well, right? Yeah, so they had a really tough time in Chisarira National Park with poaching. And um, National Park Rescue have done brilliantly to kind of uh, bay that threat at the moment. And since they came into the park and, and started to manage, there's been no instances of elephant poaching since, which is a brilliant statistic in the, in the way of the world at the moment. With mm -hmm. I think it's one elephant every 15 minutes is, is under threat from mm -hmm. poaching. Um, so they're doing a brilliant job. I think the, the core difference between National Park Rescue and Game Rangers International is the militarization of National Park Rescue. It's a much more heavily militarized zone. Um, probably on the basis that the threats are much higher and much more volatile. So it's important that National Park Rescue are combating their own threat, which is uh, weapons and violence and um, 
Game Rangers International are, are a bit more community focused as the threat is a little bit lower. Um, and I was actually going to ask you about the sort of the militarization of conservation. I know that's something that's always sort of, uh, you know, just does come really hand in hand with Rangers. And I wondered what your view was or what your if if you have a view kind of like in the future and, and how you see, so, so, you know, SOXA being um, aligned with these kind of organizations. Yeah, what your thought sure. was that? So I think for us, we stay very clearly onto personal welfare, which is the boots and, and the uh, basic equipment rather than any weapons, etc. But at the same time, we, we totally acknowledge that, you know, they are very important parts of their um, genetics as rangers to make sure that they're armed and being able to defend themselves. You know, they do put themselves out on the line of fire, um, which is very brave of them. And it's important that they can protect themselves at all times because it's a very hostile environment at times and um, poachers will do anything they can to get rid of um, rangers to make sure they have access to elephants or other species. Um, so we don't we don't necessarily align ourselves in a good or bad way to, to weaponization, um, but militarization in terms of the other formats, which is strategy um, and correlation between uh, planning and uh, scouts and all of these sort of styles of military strategy. I think rangers are doing brilliantly with that. Um, I say that we definitely align with the fact that they're strategizing how they're going to protect species. And I think that is probably the way forward to protect species that are under extreme threat. And obviously, um, the trade in um, Ill the illegal wildlife trade um, and, with, you know, with te technological developments um, within poaching, um, you know, these kind of things are increasing. How do you see sort of sock stars ob objectives changing to match that, to keep up with that? Do you see that or? I think so. I think. Our job at Sockstar is to make sure that the rangers that we support have their basic needs met at all times. And that's if there's more rangers coming in and there's a growth in employment in each camp of rangers, then we'll try and move with the flow of numbers. Uh, I don't think we're going to move too heavily outside of the basic welfare. And instead of moving into more expensive items, I think we'll move to different projects. And the idea for us is to have a global web of projects in the next few years. And I think moving into Asia is very exciting. And that looks like it's going to be coming shortly. Um, and, and for us, making sure that we have a different set of rangers in different countries and acknowledge that rangers, whilst they're different in different countries they're ultimately the same sorts of people you know they're brave they protect ecosystems and they're very selfless people and with the same basic needs i guess that you're trying to exactly. help you know alleviate spot on um so talk to me about the next kind of like five to ten years maybe you haven't thought that maybe we're looking at the next like two to yep. three years but then yep. what does that what does that look like yeah so you touched on asia just yeah now. it's a question i've been asked a lot and especially as i'm leaving university in the next yeah in the next 18 months i'll be finished at uni and the question for me is, you know, do I carry on with Sockstar and how am I going to manage Sockstar and getting a full time job um, elsewhere? And I think it's a really good question is we have to make sure that our strategy is scalable and making sure that the projects that we support currently can be supported in the future. We don't ever want to leave ranges behind in that sense, but also in the future for us to make sure that we're looking into different types of uh, conservation. So that might be in South America and, and recognizing that conservation happens globally outside of the most commonly sort of recognized areas of Southern Africa, that we can go into really diverse ecosystems and, and support ranges there. So it's a big focus for us is to have more than, more than two or three projects in the future but we need to make sure that we'll only start new projects and, and support new ranger groups when we have, you know, secured and, and sustained all of our support for the current ones that we have. Of course. Yeah. So I think that's that's part of, of the plan. The other part of the plan is to make sure that we increase our fundraising so that we can, you know, we can really scale up and hopefully become a bit more professional. At the moment, it's a bit of a one man band, um, but that's OK. I think all things have started like that once upon a time. Uh, but in the future, yeah, it would be great if we could scale it up, support more projects and really, um, you know, connect more uh, fields of life into working in conservation as well. And have you got a project in Asia in mind? Yeah. Maybe so you the, don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So it's, it's slightly under um, under negotiation at the moment. But yeah, it's going to be in Maharashtra. Um, it's looking into leopard and human conflict and also tiger and human conflict. And, and as sure as you all know, um, with the population growth in India, it's going to be a really interesting challenge to see how rangers are integrating population and species at the same time and for us to go forward and make sure that this is a different project uh, with different needs but um, also very similar challenges and it'll be really interesting yeah I was just gonna say it'd be really interesting to kind of compare contrast see what you can learn from the kind of Africa Asia yeah. difference yeah, that'll be sure. interesting I think their cultures are very different but ultimately at a very basic level I think they're quite similar um, so yeah it will be really interesting I'm excited 
to try and see how Soxar um, performs in a different country, how our products are received and things like that. But I think, yeah, I think it's a really good opportunity in the future. It'll be interesting as well to see kind of um, if they have different requirements. I know you said that, you know, you ask Rangers first, you kind of have that conversation. What is it that you think that you're lacking? Yeah. It'll be interesting to yeah. see if those things differed. So an interesting point for the Indian project is that um, whilst in Africa, basic needs such as boots and socks might be lacking in India and across India, outside of conservation, there's a high level of energy poverty. Mm -hmm. And so the project in India will be looking into energy sustainability for ranger projects and how accommodation blocks for rangers can be solarized to mean that they can have clean energy access, which means that they can power their lives also when they get home in the dark. They don't get a hot shower at the moment and just little things like that to boost their um, boost their esteem, but also to make them feel that they're well respected. So you say really little insane. things. That sounds like quite a monumental change that I feel like you're, you know, don't do it disservice. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I think it's little things that we take for granted. The hot shower we've had this morning or uh, the lights that we have on today. These are little things that we might appreciate as, you know, as they're just given, you know, and, and for uh, the Indian rangers that we're supporting in the future, it's not a given. And it's exciting for us that whilst we see them as small things, they are actually pretty big things to, to the Indian rangers. So it's really exciting. I think there's a lot to be thought about, about how, you know, rangers fit in in this, in this cycle of energy poverty. And if people protecting ecosystems don't have access to energy, then what hope do the rest of the population have? And that's a really interesting debate that's going on at the moment between you know, big organizations is how are developing countries going to get their access to energy, meaning that they can sustain um, rates of conservation. Um, and just on a side note, I know that in Zambia, um, you know, uh, wood and the the use of wood is, is a really heavy resource and um, deforestation rates are increasing to fuel energy for fuel wood. And so developing countries are going to come in, in close contact, I think, with conservation via the use of energy. No, that's really interesting. Um, and I know that you're also really um, passionate about the kind of collaboration between um you know, the corporate world and the NGO world, which you're obviously quite um, focused on now. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's been a, it's been a great relationship um, that's just begun between Ernst & Young and Sockstar. It's fortunate that we've got a good contact there who's been really uh, generous to us and they've given us a lot of support. Uh, I think on a, on a philosophical level, I think collaboration between corporates and NGOs is going to have to happen at some point. Um, there's there's increasing evidence that um, if corporates have sustainability policies, they're going to perform better um, in financial terms. And I think for that reason, they're often aligning themselves with NGOs and making sure that uh, whether it's ecosystems or climate change support is, is beginning. I think it's really important that they do um, start to take action because they have a lot of information capital. They have a lot of financial capital and for that reason, they have a lot of ability to create change. So we need to see, I think, corporate firms, instead of being threats to the ecosystems that exist today, they are also the opportunity for tomorrow. No, absolutely. And how did that relationship kind of develop with you and um, EY? Were you an intern there? Is that right? Yeah, so I, I did some work experience there um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I just, you know, it was always interested in conservation at the time and spoke um, to the partner that I was shadowing at the time. Um, and he also is involved in cricket, uh, at a different cricket club, um, one of the rival clubs to us. Um, but he's a really nice guy and he made sure that he supported me and, and introduced me to the EY Foundation, which is their charitable arm. Uh, and so they've given us um, support for an event in April, which is going to be fantastic, which I know you know you're hosting. <laughs> um, but it'll be really exciting because that gives us access to the corporate world uh, we've got lots of people from different groups, investment banks, fund managers, corporate accountants, etc. And they're all going to come together and we're going to ask that question is, what can we be doing? What can we be doing better? And when can we do it? And I think those three questions are going to be really interesting to ask them because ultimately we have a lot of um, a lot of slack to pick up. There's lots of people that want to get involved but aren't quite sure when or how they can do that. So I think we need to really activate this corporate market and make sure that people go, okay, I, c I can get involved in this. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to be everything or nothing. You can contribute something. And I think Sockstar proves that in a way. Yeah, I love that. You're kind of working from like a grassroots mm. level, really making a difference. So who have you got speaking then um, at the event? That's yeah, so up? I've got Will, Will Travers, which is going to be great. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Dr. Narmakan as well. 
um, Shruti Suresh from the Environmental Investigation Agency and myself. And yourself. Yeah, so I think I'm probably the small fish on that list. But I think it'll be really interesting all the same. Great to have them sort of mentor me at the same time. I, I you know, speak to them about how I'd go about speaking to these groups. Um, you know, Will's done done thousands of these um, and this is my first one. So it's great. It's great to be able to do it young. Uh, and, and get my head in the door at some point now and, and really try and inspire a few of the older corporate groups and clients as well. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. I'm excited. No, I'm excited. Um, it will be, be great. Good fun. Yeah. Um, so tell me, I mean, this must have been such a learning curve for you. I mean, what were the first, how did you really go, what, what, what were kind of like the first steps that you went from this idea to, you know, really creating something? Yeah, so I've always been interested in sort of entrepreneurship and, and how you can start your own business and what things you might need. Um, but it's quite different in nonprofit because you don't really have a product. You have a, uh, a cause instead mm -hmm. of a product. So it began with the pilot project sending socks out and the response I received was so positive. I thought there's something more to be done here. And I think very quickly after that, I realized that there's more to life than socks. So we can achieve more, we can send boots, we can send um, higher value, but also very important bits of, of kit out uh, or buy them in country. And I think I worked out that social media at my age as well is very important and activating a, a group of social media is really important. So now we've got thousands of followers online, which is really cool. Uh, and, and slightly, you know, I didn't really expect that to happen as quickly as it did. I have to say I'm always following you. I'm like trying to get tips. I'm like, yeah. Lewis, how are you doing this? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's been fun. It has been fun. And I'm that's why I'm doing it, because I'm having fun. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't enjoy it. I know it's important as well. Um, but I'm really waking up out every day and getting out of bed and going, yeah, this is great fun. You know, I get to speak to people I would have never met before. I get to be on shows like this that I probably would never have been on before. Um, and I'm really in a new environment that I didn't know I'd be in at some point. And doing it as a student has been brilliant because it just makes sure that you have some scope on life. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think step by step, we've been working to achieve little things, whether that's uh, getting a charity rugby game at university, which is coming up in a few weeks, or whether that's just, you know, getting another donation of five pounds. It's, it's little by little. And I think uh, we're very humble in the sense that we're not looking for big money from, you know, major events and big sponsors, but we are looking for support or even just to smile when you hear our name. We're just trying to do our little bit. And I think it's been really interesting trying to activate different groups of people, whether that's young people, but also trying to get in touch with older people too and go, do you kind of understand why this is so important? And they're really on board. So yeah, across the board, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, I don't know what's next. I think it's exciting in that way that there could be some really great turns around the corner. But that's the great thing about Sockstar is I think every day is a new uh, is a new chapter but also you know you can get an email from someone you know wow like this is really exciting time yeah, it's quite changing for you, you very know, quickly and just one email can be because you're so small like it could be quite really quite monumental yeah you. there's been a lot of um, ups and downs I know I sound like a cliche book but it has been a day of up and down where um, some days you get promised the world and the next you know they say sorry we're kind of busy and just give us a minute um, and, and actually they do seem to come around eventually, but you know, we really want to tackle fast paced and solve problems as quick as we can, because for us, there's no real fundraising limit. We're not exposed financially, which is great, but every bit of penny that we do raise, every pound and penny that we raise goes straight to the projects. And that's really important to us. A hundred percent of the money that we've raised has gone to our projects on ground. So Born Free are brilliant in supporting me and doing all of the financial regulation for us, which means that I can kind of work on the sunny side of conservation, um, looking after you know the, the fun bits and, and you know letting Born Free manage the bit more um, you know, massive bits, which is great. Um, and so, yeah, I think... As a principal, not taking any money for expenses or things like that in the last year has been not very difficult at all, but really important to kind of get this message across that if we're trying to enact change, we need to be very selfless and selfless like the Rangers, I think, is important. Not doing it because it benefits you, but doing it in the realisation that it's the right thing to do. And what have been some of the biggest challenges for you um, and things that you've learned that you think actually could be translated elsewhere? Mm, I think... One of the bigger challenges was realizing that ultimately you're not going to change the world uh, overnight and realizing you have to find a goal and try and just beat that goal every time, set a new goal and small goals rather than, you know, overarching huge fundraising totals, just little by little get um, 
get to a next goal. I think that's been difficult realizing that it's only going to be a very small project. Um, and some people speak to you and, and do promise you the world when, when they speak to you and say, you know, we can really take this I know this, this guy who, yeah. yeah. I, you know, and I'll, I'll introduce you and, and it never seems to materialize. Um, but that was, that was a challenge in itself, but it's actually been quite easy. I think I've, um, I've grown up been quite lucky that, you know, my parents are quite good at supporting me with advice. Um, they're very, um, seldom support me, you know, financially with Sockstar, but with advice, they're very good in saying, just be careful. You don't expose yourself and say, this is what we're going to achieve. You know, surprise people. It's nice to surprise people and overachieve rather than not meeting your targets, uh, which is a good, a good life lesson. I, I might, they might not agree in an investment bank, but I think it's nice to just keep it quiet. And if you've got some good news, share it. Um, but it's been, I think another challenge has been that consistently posting on social media. It's been pretty, pretty long slog, um, finding content, which doesn't come every day because, you know, once we've got the photo, the boots on the project, you know, we can only share that so many times. So yeah, making sure that we're regularly keeping in contact with the public and being in the public domain often is important, but is also pretty tedious at times because, you know, it doesn't really enact much change. It's just a sort of, yep, yeah, we're still around. Taking over, taking reminding over. people. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. And speaking of, um, so what is your fundraising link just before we wrap up? Um, and I guess, yeah, th th if people want to find out more, head to the Sockstar Project on Instagram. Yeah, but yeah. for your marathon. Yeah, it's just a Just Giving page. Lewis Bedford 7, I think is, is it. But yeah, no. We'll any, put it in the show notes. Yeah, plug. Any, any would be amazing. I mean, yeah, I'm sure I'll get around the course at some point. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, we look forward to, and I'll actually see you on the day. Um, So Brilliant. yeah, because I'll be there for the Born Free stand as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much, Lewis. No, my pleasure. And, yeah, we'll let you get it. back yeah. to up to Durham. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes follow us on social media or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke and our producer is Philip Fortuna. See you next time.